Hey guys, today we're going to be setting up and reviewing the footage of this DeWall fisheye security camera. It's a 12 megapixel camera with a 1.98 millimeter lens and given its hefty price tag and that it has a Sony sensor on board with Starvis technology, I can't wait to get this one up and running. So lots of information to cover today, so let's get started. First off, Starvis, it means that the camera can produce high quality images in low visible light and with IR light. It has a back illuminated sensor and can supposedly capture a wider range of light than a regular sensor. We'll put that to the test when we install this camera in various locations. I purchased mine for about $360 US, but the price can be as high as $1,220. Given that high price point, let's be picky about the review and see if we can get a flawless and inexperienced from the unboxing right to reviewing the daytime and nighttime footage. Product links are in the description below, as always. This camera has a huge 1 over 1.7 CMOS sensor and can deliver video at 25 frames per second at 12 megapixels or 4000 by 3000 pixels. So here in the box we have the weather sealing coupler to protect the RJ45 connection. We have some screws to install the camera on the wall and some anchors. We have a star wrench and we have some star screws. We have an awkwardly written user manual which uh, looks like they use Google Translate to create. There's a CD. I no longer have a CD drive on my computer so hopefully the install guide will let me know what I need to do to get set up. So here you have the camera itself. You can definitely feel the quality here. This is where they've invested the money. It has a nice sturdy metal case on it and it weighs just about two pounds. Now given its low profile, they've rated the camera IK10 vandal resistant. Next, we have the mounting bracket, which doesn't actually seem to have any sort of locking mechanism on it. So make sure to install the camera high enough so it's out of reach. It's kind of strange that the camera doesn't lock, but it does have these little indentations that fit into the back of the camera. And lastly, we have the jaw template. So let's have a close up look at the camera. The camera is IP67 weatherproof and it works in minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 22 Fahrenheit, which is important to know here in Canada. There are three IR lights here on the front for night vision, allowing you to see 10 meters or 32 feet away. There's three small holes right here for the microphone. And at the bottom of the camera, there's a door. Let's have a look inside. There is a slot inside for a micro SD card with a maximum capacity of 128 gigs for onboard storage. Slide the hatch and it will open on its hinge. Place the card into position and close the latch. Slide the hinge and it will lock it into place. I'm surprised that there's no hard reset inside. So here at the end of the leads we have an RJ45 connection which accepts power over Ethernet or PoE. And the camera will use up to a maximum of 12 watts of power but during my testing I only noticed it go up to 7 watts. Next, we have a 12 volt connection, but there's no power supply included as expected. Here we have an audio in and out, followed by several wires for the alarm inputs and outputs. Before installing this camera in my test locations, let's get it set up on my network by plugging it into my PoE switch and recording some footage in Blue Iris. We'll also set it up on my dedicated NVR and see how the process works there. The quick install guide indicates that the IP address for this camera is 192.168.1.108 and my subnet in my home network is 192.168.0.x so I'm going to need some sort of tool to change the IP address. I downloaded the tool called DeWall's config tool and this tool allowed me to change the IP address and activate the camera. Do a Google search for DeWall's config tool and click on the first result. The title is download links, but don't click on the huge screenshots, that's not the right link. The actual download link is the label just below. Once installed, all the dual devices on your network are going to show in the list. Press initialize to activate the camera and give it a password. To update the IP address, select the camera and click on the green icon on the right. Enter the new IP address, subnet mask and your router's IP address. I'll change mine to 192.168.0.87. I change the 1 to a 0 to match the first three sets of numbers of my router. When I hit save, it said that there was a password error. But hidden in the search settings icon on the top of the screen, there's a spot where you can enter your password and it's the same password that you gave the camera. Now once updated, you can change the camera's IP information and then access the camera from a browser. If you are a Chrome user and you want to access the camera's web user interface, you're going to need a plugin installed. When accessing the camera through Chrome going forward, you're going to need to click on this plugin and not Chrome's address bar. Most features will work, but the default features will not work here. 
In Internet Explorer, the live view frame is huge and it cannot be scrolled or downsized. This prevents you from accessing the configuration features. I discovered that there is a program out there called Smart PSS for dual cameras and NVRs, giving you access to the live view, recorded footage, and to the camera settings. Its user interface is a little bit confusing, takes a little bit of getting used to, so give it some time. To add this camera to Blue Iris, I selected the Dual brand and Mainstream RTSP for the model series in the camera's properties. Selecting generic Owen VIF would also work. For me, I record continuously and this camera uses about 42 gigs of space per day. If you are using a dedicated NVR to record your footage, you can do so in a few ways. First off is over your network. Note the camera's IP address and port and enter that information into one of the channel placeholders on your NVR. The second way is by updating the camera's IP address to be on the same subnet as the NVR, such as 192.168.254.87. Update the IP address from your computer using the config tool and then plug the camera into one of the PoE ports on the back of the NVR. Then you can open up one of the channels on the NVR and update the IP address to that of the camera. So if your camera is brand new and hasn't been activated yet, let's plug that into one of the PoE ports on the NVR. And remember, this NVR is of a different brand name. Let's see what happens. The NVR cannot access it, so you'll need to go through the activation process already discussed. So let's discuss where you'd install this camera, but first, the purpose of it is to cover as wide of an area as possible. The viewing angle is 180 degrees, both vertically and horizontally, meaning it's a circle. You can install the camera outside, flat against a wall, or over a door to give a view of all of your surroundings. If you have an awning, placing this camera on the ceiling would provide a 360 degree view, including the doorway and the entryway. Make sure you note which side is up so that when you're looking at the image, it's positioned correctly. There's a notch here located at the top, and I actually wrote the word top there so I wouldn't forget it during the install. Also, test out your proposed location to make sure that you're getting the image that you're expecting. And make sure that there's no light fixtures nearby because they'll create a glare on the lens. For our first temporary location, let's start right here under the awning of my back deck. Cool, I can see everything from here. Anyone exiting, entering my house, walking up the stairs, I can see it all. I can even see my back fence at 300 feet away. That's pretty cool. Let me take a walk from the fence to the door. I can see what's going on in the distance. Not a lot of detail until I reach the 25 foot mark and the daytime picture quality is perfect. In nighttime mode, with the IR lights deactivated, I see nothing but a blur. With the IR lights on, the image isn't very bright, except for the floor deck, which is not very surprising since it is 9 feet away from the camera. When I step in front of the camera, the IR lights blow out the image. If I turn on BLC backlit mode, the image is much brighter and offers the best nighttime solution. The image when I walk by the camera is adjusted and not blown out. Let's look at the live viewing modes in Smart PSS. To use live view, you need to hit the plus at the top of the page, then click live view. Add the camera to the viewing page and double click on it so it takes up the whole viewing area. Right click to see what they call fish eye installation mode, which refers to the camera's installation orientation. Select the position to update the different possibilities for dewarp views. Next, select how you want the fish eye view broken out. This feature is pretty neat and allows you to set up different viewing angles as if you had multiple cameras in one. However, this doesn't affect how the footage in Blue Iris is saved, as you can see in the image here on the right. Back here on the web user interface using the Chrome plugin, you can select various recording modes, which will take effect in Blue Iris. Make sure you hit save after each selection. Blue Iris will need to be refreshed in order to handle the change. And I do this by disabling and re-enabling the camera. In this view, you do lose some detail, but it may come in handy. Strangely enough, the ability to update the record modes in Smart PSS is not available. Before we move on, let's do a quick sound test. Okay, this is about 10 feet away, and this is 5 feet away. If you're having some trouble getting the sound to work like I did, make sure it's set to mic and the sensitivity is turned way up on the audio page. 
Next, let's test out a different install right here over my garage door. Wow, the visibility is fantastic. I can see the entire view in front of my home with just one camera. Now on this cold sunny day, I'm holding a license plate. At the 75 foot mark, you can barely make out the text. It's not until I'm 50 feet away where you can comfortably see the characters. This is perfect. So a super wide camera, able to pick up fine details when the sun is shining directly on the lens. Very nice. Now from the side at near 180 degrees from the camera, I'm 30 feet away and the plate is still legible. Impressive. At night with the IR lights off, the visibility is great, but any motion creates a blur. The plate isn't visible until I stop at 8 feet away. Now let's turn off those Christmas lights and turn on the IR lights. Reading the plate here is impossible because of its reflective surface. When I approach from the side, the IR lights are actually able to reach that angle. I wasn't expecting that. The only usable recording mode besides 1.0 is 1P as we scan through the various modes. In Smart PSS, you have a few more options, but again, the fisheye view is best. Oh yeah, check out the trailers left behind by this rabbit. Normally we don't see trailers with a high quality sensor. This reminds me of some footage I posted a few years back using a $100 Hikvision camera of a fox. That's quite the difference. On the other hand, the color of the sky in the sped up 24 hour video is pretty nice. Let's say I want to install the camera here. We can test out this location by attaching the camera to my fan, which is close enough to the install location to see what the image is going to look like. Using the normal profile, I'm able to capture some good footage both day and night. There is little to no blur at night. Here's a quick look at some recording modes in this scenario. And again, let's have a look at some of the views in Smart PSS. And for our last test location, let's have some fun. Place it in the yard, facing upwards, looking at the sky. This is my test location right here in the middle of my yard. The blue sky looks perfect. I'm so impressed with the daytime footage. In order to see the stars at night, I increase the shutter speed and the gain on the night profile. I also turned off the IR lights. Since the camera will not switch profiles based on lighting conditions, the image gets blown out when the sun is up and the camera is still using the night profile. I set up a schedule to switch between the two. This is definitely a dislike about this firmware. Normal means the camera always used the normal profile. Full time means that the camera always used the daytime or nighttime profile all the time. Since I'm using the schedule because the camera's firmware doesn't automatically switch between profiles, I need to update it monthly with the sunrise and sunset changes. This is not the same as switching between daytime and nighttime modes where the camera will automatically adjust to the various settings within the profile. It's a lot more confusing than it needs to be. I also found it frustrating that my scheduled profile would not take effect sometimes until I logged into the camera and clicked on the conditions tab where you define the profile. See how the picture finally adjusts to my nighttime profile here and I didn't make any settings change. Anyways, let's check out a 24 hour time lapse. Pretty cool. One thing I did notice here which I did not like was the frost build up on the dome cover when the temperature drops quickly at night. Now for the water test, let's dump a bucket of water on the camera and see what happens. As expected, no issues. 
So during my testing, I did struggle a little bit with the web user interfaces. Labels often get messed up, settings didn't behave as expected, and I needed to learn their awkward translated terminology. I often received a too many online users logged in message when trying to access the camera. When I try it again, it goes away. I didn't find much help on the web UI or on DeWall's own website or wiki either. But from what I can see, this is a common complaint. The daytime footage of the camera though is top notch, I'm very happy with it, but at nighttime it does suffer a little bit, especially when there's any movement, which is not cool when you're paying such a hefty price tag for that Sony sensor. The 12 megapixel sensor may be overkill for this camera because it does eat up a lot of space on the MVR. Those extra megapixels do provide some awesome resolution, but the cheaper 6 megapixel version of this camera may suffice. They also need to update the firmware to include the option of having the daytime and nighttime profile switch automatically based on environmental lighting like some of their cameras already do. I do like the fact that the camera is weatherproof and that the mic quality is also better than I expected. Thanks for letting me share my experiences with you on this camera. I hope that you found this information helpful. If so, please give the video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.